Um, thank you. And of course, um, following Elise's uh, fantastic presentation in Poland last year, it is, as we say, a hard act to follow. Um, Elise and I have shared the directorship of the museum for the last three years since we opened, and it's been a, a joint achievement. Um, she was fortunate enough to come to Poland. Uh, she's actually celebrating her wedding anniversary today, so I have the opportunity to come to Sarajevo, which has been, I have to say, uh, a marvelous and enlightening experience. Um, I'm here to say how important the award was for the museum, um, which it was, but I thought also I'd talk about a few other things. I wanted to reflect a little bit on the things that we've heard since we've been here, all of us, uh, a little bit on the design museum itself, and then really to talk a little bit about um, why design matters in the contemporary world. So the things that stay with me, uh, particularly, of course, Yasminko Halilitovic's um, very moving uh, presentation yesterday, which was um, both a very elegant and economical summation of the achievement of the War Child Museum, but also an extremely practical one about the issues of looking after museums in the 21st century. He talked about entrepreneurialism, which is certainly something that matters a lot to us at the Design Museum, where we um, have 2% of our funds come from the government and the rest has to be cent centrally generated. And there's something also special about the chance to build a museum from scratch, to build a team, to start to create um, a working practice which will outlive all of us who were there at the beginning. Yasminko also talked about the idea of museums and trust, which I think is something that those of us in America and the United Kingdom particularly need to reflect on at the moment. When we are finding our sources of funding increasingly challenged by activists who worry that we are compromising ourselves to the hydrocarbon industry, to uh, questionable sources of funding, and we find ourselves as welcoming institutions uh, pushed into a surrogate war uh, between activists and their primary targets. And of course, museums are welcoming and opening. We don't have batteries of lawyers or barbed wire around us. So we find ourselves somewhat easier targets than perhaps helicopter manufacturers or British Petroleum. I was also struck by our, our Dutch colleague from the Netherlands Open Air Museum, um, who, if I understood him correctly, suggested that he does not believe in national identity. I think there's so many museums which are there to reflect a sense of national identity. I think about the Anthropological Museum in Mexico City, which was clearly created to reflect a sense of Mexico not as a colonial foundation. Or in Brasilia, where if you're fortunate enough to go and see Juscelino Kubitschek, the founder of Brasilia's tomb, you find what must account, amounts to the beginnings of a, a foundation myth for, for Brazil as a modern state or even in Athens, where the Parthenon Museum has been built to house an object which they do not as yet have. I think also here in this magnificent city of Sarajevo, it's extraordinary to look at uh, the city through the lens of architecture and design and the way that so many cultures have left their marks here and have each tried to create a sense of a national identity. If you wander through the old city, you find the marks of the Ottoman era. If you then look at the Austrian marks of a florid attempt at nation building in the 19th century with those streets that look like they could be in Vienna, then you look at the marks of the Yugoslav kingdom um, when there was an epidemic of Art Deco building, and then the modernism of Tito's non-aligned socialism, and now here we are in Bosnia and Herzegovina building a new sense of national identity. And meanings change. Um, look, at this, look at what was once the city hall built uh, by the Austro-Hungarians, designed in Vienna in this extraordinary blend of Moorishness uh, and the Arab world, which uh, presumably the colonial administration in Vienna thought it was in some way appropriate for an Ottoman city. That was once the mark of a colonial oppressor. Now, after its destruction and its rebuilding, it's a landmark for contemporary Bosnia. And I'm also struck at the way that um, even the small things that we see here, the banknotes, think about the implications of having a note which is called the convertible mark. And I think it was actually banknotes that probably set me off on my uh, journey to become one day a design curator. It is the ultimate designer conjuring trick to turn a worthless rectangle of paper into something worth something, but worth something in a specifically national way as well. Growing up in London, uh, of course, money had the Queen's head on it. And then coming to my 
um, family home uh, in the south of Yugoslavia, I was very confused to find that money here was embellished with pictures of heroic workers and peasants. Uh, people create these identities. They're, they're, not, they're not natural things. They are constructed. So after those reflections on national identity, um, I must begin by saying that we see the design museum as being a design museum in Britain, not a museum of British design. Design, I think, has to be understood as being a borderless activity. Reflect perhaps on the iPhone, uh, which, as it says on the box, is designed by Cal in California by a team led by someone who is British. Uh, it's manufactured in a Taiwanese-owned factory in China with components from nine different countries. What can one say about its identity? The point also about design is that it's constantly changing. 30 years ago, when the museum was started, it was possible to tell the story of contemporary design through a selection of carefully chosen chairs. We've moved far beyond that now to really understand design as a way of understanding the world around us. We deal with multiple audiences with equal respect. We have learners from school children to master's students. We deal with complex issues in research, aging, mobility, artificial intelligence. But the way that we really address our audience and our business model is based on exhibitions, a program which is between five and six a year, which has succeeded in attracting around 600,000 visitors a year. The point about moving from our previous home, a modest former banana-ripening banana warehouse by the Thames, was to move design from what we saw it as usually the province of small and niche museums, or else as departments in large general museums, into something in which we could actually give the subject the attention that we thought it deserved. We set about uh, nine years ago um, on a journey to find an appropriate building. We eventually found uh, a modernist ruin, the former Commonwealth Institute, uh, and we're actually now in a situation where our building is in itself a kind of exhibit. And we opened uh, in November 2016, just after a moment of Britain inflicting massive self-harm on itself uh, by its questionable decision in the questionable referendum to leave. It was a moment when, with 30% of our staff as non-British European Union citizens, we had to offer a certain amount of reassurance. Uh, we also opened up at a moment in which we were trying to convey the message that, design, that Britain is open and that design is fundamentally an optimistic activity. I think museums have a future because they are social places. They are a place in which you can persuade your audience to switch your screen off and go and do something with other people. But of course, we also believe that um, the, the digital media are important too, and we have four million Twitter followers. We approach design as not only about uh, from the point of view of the designer, but also how things are made and how they're used. It's about people, of course. And we opened our show, um, we opened the museum with an exhibition that we titled Fear and Love. Um, reflecting on the museum's history, uh, our very first open exhibition um, 30 years ago, when we opened back in our original home, uh, was called Art and Industry. Um, now we've moved so far that we actually explore the emotional aspects of what design can be. And we invited 10 people to reflect on issues that design had some input into uh, in ways that actually they found positive or negative. This image is designed by, it's, it's from a project from uh, OMA, uh, the architects from the Netherlands, uh, which was a, no, known as a room for Europe. And you will notice that the Venetian blind in the background is uh, made up of the European Union's flags, apart from the Union flag, which has fallen to the floor, um, revealing uh, an image of wartime Rotterdam as a reminder from OMA about what is at stake with the European Union. We also looked at um, the uh, impact of technology. This was a, a robot which uh, resp responded to human presence, uh, again looking at some of the fears that people have about technology. Every year we do a Design to the Air project which looks at um, 100 inspiring projects from around the world, uh, from every category of design, from what we wear to what we see on the screen uh, to the objects that we use. Uh, this is a look at um, the attempts in the Netherlands to create plastic-free supermarkets. Uh, 
Um, we also um, have a strand in our thinking in which we uh, encourage designers to reflect on their work, not to exhibit retrospectives, but to ask them to look at new research. This was done by Hella Jongerius, the Dutch designer, uh, looking at um, what she sees as our um, diminished sense of color that has come from the industrialization of, of color coding. And this is, a pro this is uh, David Ajay, uh, currently at the museum, uh, the um, uh, Tanzanian-born, British-based architect, who looked not at his work in general, but at a series of projects which he's working on, which are all, in some ways, uh, monuments and about memories. Um, we explored the way that um, uh, design has its role to play in activism and protest, uh, a project that we called Hope to Nope, starting with um, Obama and ending with Donald Trump. Um, and of course we have conventional historical exhibitions too. This is a project that we did uh, to mark the anniversary of the uh, Soviet Revolution, uh, Imagine Moscow. And we look at the past when we think that it has relevance to our ongoing programs. We explore subjects which might not appear to be about design, but in fact we can present in design terms. So we looked at Ferrari not as a luxury car brand, but actually as understanding what the design process is in, in making and designing a car. So you can see the design process, these remarkable wooden bucks, which look, like, look as though Michelangelo might have produced them. Uh, we also had um, filming of the clay modeling uh, in the Maranello car factory. So really understanding um, the process that goes into these extraordinary things. And we try to do the same with fashion. Uh, this is um, a very beautiful exhibition that we did with Azadine Alaya shortly before the, um, his uh, untimely death. Uh, it was his last project that he worked on. And here it's um, looking at really very few fashion shows could actually subject um, clothes to this level of scrutiny. They are remarkably beautiful, crafted things and elegantly shown. Um, it's a very simple thing which didn't really, I didn't understand until our curator said, look, we've actually specially made um, the mannequins so they vanish, so you only see the garment. And this is our current show. Again, we're trying to show the process of filmmaking. So this is a look at the extraordinary work of um, the filmmaker Stanley Kubrick, in which each of his films, always made in London, uh, whether it was about the war room or about um, going to the moon or about Vietnam, was all done in London in the age of analog filmmaking. So these are handcrafted films, as it were. So we plunge our visitors through the silver screen and into an evocation of Stanley Kubrick's head, uh, designed, I think, perhaps like it could be the back of a movie set. So, um, a word then about um, what design significance is. Uh, this um, remarkable figure is Buckminster Fuller, um, a man who notably um, repeated a well-known phrase to suggest that the most effective way to predict the future is to design it yourself. Um, Fuller predicted lots of things. Um, I'm not sure he quite got um, the three-wheeled um, car um, Dymaxion quite right. Uh, when it was unveiled at the Chicago World's Fair, it unfortunately crashed, went into a crowd and killed a pedestrian. Um, but his view of what the world could be was a mix of the utopian and the critical. So this project that he made back in the 30s, is this an awful warning for what Man Manhattan might be or is it actually a practical solution? Uh, both a technocrat and a dreamer. And some of those dreams, of course, um, have real-world consequences. Uh, Norman Foster, one of his most enthusiastic followers, produced uh, this building for Apple, um, which takes us to another man whose impact on uh, the future has been massive. Uh, let's not forget that it's only 12 years since uh, Jobs uh, launched the iPhone, which he teasingly revealed as half an iPod, a music player, and half a mobile phone. And initially, all of us were nonplussed. What had happened to the buttons on a phone? Why was it so big? Why did it need a screen? And quite quickly, of course, the world changed in ways which even Jobs would not have predicted. Uh, this, these series of apps are showing such different ways in which we relate to each other, in which people meet each other, which have enormous real-world consequences. If you're meeting online like this, do you actually need to hang out in a bar? What happens to the bar list of cities? Uh, if you can buy everything that you need on Amazon, what happens to retailing in the conventional shopping mall or the high street? 
uh, or it's doing extraordinary things to our idea of privacy. I mean, the idea that you would actually allow Amazon employees access to your home to leave a parcel behind while you're out is something that would not have existed in any previous century. Or the way that we transit cities. You know, Uber has utterly changed transport. It's having all kinds of unpredicted consequences. Usually these things are presented by the originators as being entirely benign. Uh, Uber, of course, makes it uh, easier and cheaper to move around town, but it also has the impact of increasing car journeys and therefore uh, pollution. Or the idea of Airbnb, uh, which again is presented entirely benignly initially, and now we find cities from San Francisco to Barcelona to London uh, in, in uh, catching up to deal with the way that um, this kind of peer-to-peer -peer letting has introduced a kind of uh, unofficial hotel industry which has very serious consequences for what is li life is like in cities which attract their attentions. And social media, of course, was intended to bring about the democracy of the Arab Spring. It brought us Donald Trump. Design, we hope, will make the world a better place. And there are so many examples in which, which we show in the museum which can do that. So this is uh, an operating theatre in a backpack, which in the field can actually produce sterile conditions. This is an attempt to use smartphone technology to do preliminary eye testing, which can then be uh, emailed back to a hospital to actually get results in the field. Um, this is forensic architecture, an extraordinary group based at Goldsmiths in London who use architectural, digital and media techniques to analyze a wide range of crime scenes. Um, this is in Mexico. Uh, they've operated in Bosnia as well. Uh, this is a, a reminder that, of course, uh, the tap and tap water is the greatest luxury that we can possibly have. And yet, um, a generation has been um, schooled into believing that pure water only comes in a plastic Evian bottle. So this is the work of a Dutch designer celebrating the specialness of a tap using a traditional meat material, terracotta, which is a natural coolant, in a way to remind us that we should actually celebrate the tap and tap water and what that means. And then finally, this is a reminder that uh, the world is digital as well. This is gov.uk, the government website in Britain, which is the front door to the country. Uh, this is a slogan from the team that designed it. Don't ask how it should look, ask what it must do. But at the Design Museum, we also ask, what does it mean? Thank you very much.